thank you for staying with us for the World Leading Hospitals post-conference. And for the next presentation, I'm honored to introduce once again Professor Jonathan Javid, CEO and founder of NeuroRx. Professor Javid, the floor is yours. Thank you, Donna. It's great to have a chance to talk a bit about the work we're doing with RLF 100, which is our temporary name until we announce the true product name for Aviptadil, which we're using to treat respiratory failure in patients who have COVID-19. And Aviptadil is a fancy name for a natural hormone that's made in the body called vasoactive intestinal peptide. It's a 28 amino acid hormone. It has no known toxicities and it's primarily concentrated in the lung. Now, we've known for a long time from, from in vitro work, that is in test tubes, that this hormone inhibits the replication of the SARS coronavirus in lung cells. It increases production of critical surfactants, and I'll, I'll explain what that is. It inhibits inflammation from cytokines, and we've known in the past that case control studies show that people who have higher levels of VIP in their blood have an increased chance of survival. Now, we've been doing prospective studies that have shown a very substantial improvement in survival on hazard ratio, improved recovery from respiratory failure, a substantial difference in what's called the ordinal scale. That's the scale by which doctors rate how sick somebody is with COVID-19 and a fourfold improvement in blood oxygenation. So right now, in addition to the FDA phase three data we're, uh, we're generating, that is a randomized control trial, we also have an expanded access protocol that's active in the US and also in Israel for patients who have severe COVID-19, uh, critical COVID-19, with respiratory failure. And those patients are getting three infusions of RLF 100 uh, over the course of three days. Uh, and I'm here to tell you a bit about what we're seeing. So let's go back to the history. This is certainly not a new molecule. Uh, it's a molecule that's been around for 65 million years, but it was discovered by Professor Sami Saeed, who, uh, was born in Egypt, traveled to the United States as a young physician, trained at Johns Hopkins, and in 1970, he took a sabbatical and went to the Karolinska Institute in Sweden in order to try to discover why patients who have blood clots in their lungs, that's a pulmonary embolus is the word doctors like to use, why patients with blood clots in their lungs have sudden uh, often fatal reductions in their blood pressure. And he had the idea that some sort of hormone was being released in the lung that would cause this reduction. So he went off to the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm in order to try to make the discovery. And he started out looking for the hormone in animal lungs, but he literally couldn't buy enough kilograms of animal lungs from local slaughterhouses uh, to isolate the peptide, but he could buy very large quantities of animal intestines. So that's how he isolated the peptide. Uh, he wanted to name it very important peptide because he realized how important it would be to biology, but the editors of the journal Nature wouldn't let him do that. So he named it vasoactive intestinal peptide, even though it mostly works in the lung. And over the next 50 years, he and others wrote more than 500 scientific publications showing the role of VIP in protecting the lung against all sorts of injuries. It's the reason you can inhale smoke and the lung can repair itself. It's the reason people occasionally inhale stomach contents and the lung can repair itself. Now, his final study, before he retired from Stony Brook University, together with Dr. George Youssef, who's now our colleague in uh, Houston Methodist Hospital, was to see if he could protect patients who were suffering from acute respiratory distress syndrome caused by bacterial sepsis with VIP. 
and he got permission to treat eight patients at Stony Brook Hospital. These were people who were dying of what's called ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, in the ICU on ventilators. And all eight patients showed some degree of improvement in their blood oxygen. Seven of those patients were successfully discharged alive from the ICU. Uh, and six of them walked out of the hospital alive on their own two legs. Unfortunately, one had a heart attack about a month after uh, leaving the ICU uh, and didn't leave the hospital. Now, Sammy retired the next year and the work was taken over by uh, a major pharmaceutical company that stopped working in the area of acute respiratory distress and started working in the area of chronic disease. So really, the invention sat from 2005 until March of this year when uh, my colleague Eve Sago at Relief Therapeutics uh, realized that perhaps the same effects that were seen in acute respiratory distress syndrome might be beneficial for people with COVID-19. And so far, that hypothesis has turned out to have a great deal of promise. And you've probably seen in the press that we've reported very encouraging early results from what happens when we treat people with critical COVID-19 and respiratory failure with a Viptidol. So in order to understand what's going on, you need to understand something about the anatomy and the biology of the lung. And for this, I really have to thank uh, Professor uh, Robert Mason at the National Jewish Hospital in Denver, Colorado, because he's probably contributed the most in the understanding of the anatomy of the lung, and especially the alveolar type two cell which is critical to the whole COVID-19 story. So let's start out with fish because fish have a very simple way of getting oxygen out of their environment and into their blood. They swim through the water, the water flows across their gills and as the water flows across their gills, the oxygen from the seawater goes into the bloodstream of the fish. It gives the fish the energy it needs to swim uh, and everybody's happy except for the smaller fish that the fish eats. The problem is, as human beings emerged or as mammals emerged from the oceans and began to breathe air on land, we had a problem. And the problem is that thing that we call the atmosphere is actually a mixture of gases that are quite toxic to the lining of the gill, the lining of the respiratory epithelium. Everybody knows what happens if you take a fish out of water and put it on land. Contact with the air, even though there's much more oxygen in the air than there is in seawater, is toxic to those cells and the fish suffocates. So how did evolution take care of this? Well, we actually bring just a little bit of the ocean onto the land with us. Instead of the gills sticking out into the ocean environment, we have these air sacs in the lung called alveoli. And those alveoli have little bubbles of essentially salt water that line them. And because the alveoli are lined with this salt-rich mixture, this saline mixture, they're able to uh, withstand the toxic effects of the air. And all of that works just fine as long as you can maintain that what's called surfactant layer in the lung. You essentially have a little soap bubble inside each of those air sacs that first of all holds the air sac open and second of all allows oxygen to go across the surfactant layer, across the lung cells and into the blood all without harming the delicate cells of the lung. And all of this happens because of that one cell you see, the type two cell, that makes all of the surfactant. So even though the type two cell is a very rare cell in the lung, without it, the lung can't function. And that's what happens, that's what's attacked in COVID-19. 
In COVID-19, the spike protein of the coronavirus binds to that type 2 cell in the lung. It enters the type 2 cell. It shuts down production of surfactant. It increases inflammatory cytokines to form. It makes many copies of itself, and it kills the cell, releasing all of those viral particles. That's what kills people in COVID-19, because suddenly the lung is unable to transmit oxygen to the blood. Well, the way avipdil, vasoactive intestinal peptide works, is it uniquely binds to the type 2 cell in the lung. There's a special receptor on the type 2 cell that binds to VIP, and VIP enters the cell. It blocks the production of virus particles. It blocks the production of inflammatory cytokines. It increases the surfactant, and all of a sudden, the lung is able to survive the onslaught of the coronavirus. You can see this in a test tube where when you add VIP to the test tube, it blocks the replication of the coronavirus by half. It blocks the ability of the coronavirus to kill the cell by 40%. So you can see it in test tubes and you can see it in people. The other interesting thing you can see in people is that if you look at people who get critical COVID-19 and look at the difference in the level of VIP in the blood of survivors versus those who die of critical COVID-19, the survivors have twice the amount of natural VIP in their bloodstream compared to the people who die. So we went into the clinic, we went into our clinical trials believing that we had a synthetic human hormone that blocks the replication of the coronavirus in the alveolar type 2 cells of the lung, that blocks cytokine production, that blocks cell death, and that increases surfactant production, increases the ability of the type 2 cell to make the surfactant lining that's critical to the ability of the lung to function. And we licensed this technology from Stony Brook University. They were excited to show us that Sami Saeed's file cabinet was still sitting in the corner of his laboratory just as he left it 10 years ago. Uh, we came into the picture with extensive toxicology data from four species showing that VIP is non-toxic even when it's used over six months or more. Uh, and a cooperative agreement with the National Institutes of Health to test VIP against influenza and other viruses beyond COVID-19. So our path is twofold. First of all, we're at the latest stage of testing VIP in patients with critical COVID-19 those are people who are in the ICU, they're either on a ventilator or they're getting high flow oxygen and they're being treated with intravenous VIP. And now we're starting a second study to use inhaled avipdil in patients who have earlier stages of COVID in the hopes that we'll keep them out of the ICU. Now we have one study that's already showing data that we've reported. This is not our randomized prospective trial. This is a study that our colleague, Dr. Yusuf at Houston Methodist Hospital did in 21 patients who were too sick to get into our trial. Patients who had lung transplants, kidney transplants, immunosuppression from cancer, recent heart attacks, people who couldn't be randomized in our FDA phase three study and he compared them to equally sick patients who weren't getting our drug. And he showed that they were comparable at the beginning on all of the scales that people use to grade severity in patients like this, scales like the Rothman Index, the Organ System Failure Score, the, the WHO Ordinal Scale. 
So we started out with two groups of patients who were quite comparable in everything, and they were in the same ICU, being treated by the same doctors, the same nurses, according to the same protocol. The only difference is that the 21 patients got RLF 100, and the 24 patients just got the standard of care. And some very striking differences were seen. So as you can see from this survival curve, the primary endpoint in this study was whether people survived critical COVID-19. And the blue line are the patients who were treated with RLF 100 plus the standard of care. And over 60 days, they had better than an 80% chance of leaving the intensive care unit alive. Whereas the red line are the people who just got the standard of care and over the same 60 days, from the same ICU with the same doctors and nurses, they had less than a 20% chance of leaving the ICU alive. Overall, what statisticians call the hazard ratio was nine-fold difference. Similarly, you can look at the likelihood that people recovered from respiratory failure. Here, higher is better, and the blue line shows that at 60 days, people with critical COVID-19 had a 60% chance of being off the ventilator or off of high flow oxygen. In other words, they had recovered from respiratory failure, whereas the people who just got the standard of care only had about a 10% chance of recovery. And again, the hazard ratio was about nine-fold difference. You can also see it if you look at what's called the WHO ordinal scale, and this is the official scale by which people who have COVID are graded on their recovery. And there was a six point difference because the RLF 100 treated patients got several points better and the standard of care patients got several points worse. You can also see the difference in blood oxygenation. So here, higher is better. And you can see that the people who got treated with RLF 100 showed dramatic improvement in blood oxygen even within 48 hours of starting treatment. Whereas the people who were treated just with the standard of care showed very little change in blood oxygenation from the time they were entered into the study. And finally, you can see a difference on chest x-ray. This is one of many patients and if you're not a radiologist, the thing to know about chest x-rays in COVID-19 or any disease is in general, white is bad and black is good because the lung is mostly made of air. There's very limited solid material in the lung to block the x-ray. So a healthy lung is primarily black, but you can see that these patients with COVID-19 have a practically white lung because the alveoli have collapsed, there's inflammatory debris, and yet within two, three days of treatment, you start to see clearing of the lungs in a substantial number of patients. In fact, this kind of clearing was seen in 17 out of 21 patients in both lungs and in two additional patients in one lung in the people who were treated with VIP. And it was seen in far fewer patients who were treated just with the standard of care. So you've got improvement in survival. You've got improvement in recovery from respiratory failure. You've got improvement in blood oxygenation. And you can see it on x-ray. You can also see a substantial decrease in the inflammatory markers as they're measured in a hospital laboratory what they call the cytokines, which are these inflammatory molecules that are believed to cause damage in COVID-19. So we're heading for the tail end of a randomized controlled trial that's already enrolled 150 and is going to enroll more than 165 patients with critical COVID-19 and respiratory failure who are being treated with intravenous RLF 100 and now we're starting a trial of inhaled avipatidil for patients with early COVID-19 in the hopes of keeping those people from developing respiratory failure. The FDA has granted us an IND. 
We're expecting Dr. Youssef to lead the study for us again, and we're extraordinarily excited to get started. So in summary, RLF 100 has been around for a long time because vasoactive intestinal peptide has been protecting the lungs of air-breathing mammals for as long as there have been air-breathing mammals. In the laboratory, we see that this substance VIP inhibits the formation of the virus in lung cells. We see that patients who have higher levels of natural VIP in their blood are more likely to survive. And we see in prospective trials that treating patients with VIP is associated with a very substantial difference in survival and a substantial difference in recovery from respiratory failure. So Donna, thank you for asking me to share this with your audience. Thank you, Professor Javit, for your presentation. There are so many follow-up questions. I just want to make sure and recap, if you could, what is the RLF-100? So RLF-100 is our working name for aviptadil. And aviptadil is synthetic VIP, or vasoactive intestinal peptide. The only difference between aviptadil and VIP is aviptadil is made in a factory, VIP is made in your body, but it's the same 28 amino acid peptide. Now, there seems to be so many experimental um, uh, treatments for COVID-19. Each has its own proponents. To paraphrase a famous saying, what is special? Why is your medicine or this medicine, medicine different from all the other medicines? Well, there are several broad categories of medications that are used to treat COVID-19. One are the antivirals like remdesivir that are designed to kill the coronavirus. And then you have this whole category of anti-inflammatory medicines that in one way or another try to mop up the inflammatory cytokines that are associated with the viral infection. And none of them has worked very well. Uh, our medicine, and it's really not our medicine, it's, it's invented uh, through nature, uh, and naturally synthesized in the body already uh, is a peptide hormone that enables the lining of the lung, enables the pulmonary epithelial cells to resist the virus. And it's actually been around in nature for as long as air-breathing mammals have been breathing air. Now, when you say peptide, the word is a bit confusing. Can you elaborate? Sure. Uh, amino acids are the building blocks of the body. Proteins are made of amino acids. And peptides are very short proteins. Okay. It sounds like an unfamiliar word, but everybody's familiar with insulin. Insulin is simply a peptide that regulates blood sugar. Growth hormone is a, is a peptide that uh, enables the body to, to actually grow. Mm -hmm. And in this case, VIP is a peptide that protects the type 2 cell that lines the lung and is essential to the lung's ability to make oxy to transmit oxygen to the blood. And, you know, before COVID, I think we never used the words respiratory distress as much as we do uh, today. Is it just a fancy word for, you know, not being able to breathe? Well, a lot of people think that, and it's absolutely untrue. So there are two parts to our ability to use air. One is our ability to move air in and out of the lung. Some people call that the ability to ventilate the lung, inhale and exhale. Respiration, the respiratory unit of the lung, is the ability of the lung to take oxygen from the air and bring it into the bloodstream. Now, I'm sure there are lung specialists in the audience who will tell me that I just mangled that because I'm a dumb ophthalmologist. <laughs> But if I'm explaining this to the, the average person at the dinner table, that's how I would explain it. The, the lung has to be able to move air, to move oxygen out of the atmospheric air and into the bloodstream. And when the lung can't do that, that's respiratory failure. And you're saying that the COVID does its lethal damage by attacking just that kind of cell in the body? Well, COVID is even more specific than that. So... The SARS coronavirus infects just about every mammal around, but the only mammal that seems to get COVID-19 disease and die of respiratory failure is the human being. 
People have talked about. So, yeah. Unfortunately, so people have talked about bats and pangolins, but you don't see dead bats everywhere. Unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of dead people, and what's happening is the virus is able to attack this very specialized cell in the lung, the type two cell that makes the surfactant layer that lines the lung. So, in in order to understand what's going on, you kind of have to start out with fish. Okay. Fish swim through the sea, and they don't really have any issues breathing. The seawater goes across their gills. The oxygen comes out of the seawater. It goes into the fish's blood, and the fish is able to swim around and eat other fish. That's what fish do for a living. The problem is, if you take a fish out of the sea, where there's relatively little oxygen in the water, and put it onto the land, where there's all the oxygen you could ever want in the air, the fish dies very quickly. And it dies because that mixture of gases that we call the atmosphere is toxic to the cells that cover the gills it's of the fish. It's too much. It's too much. For well, them. it's not only too much, but imagine everybody knows what happens if your eye dries out. You get dry eye, then you get a sore eye because you've had a couple of the uh, corneal epithelial cells die from contact with air because the tears didn't cover the front of the eye. Well, in the same way, if you lose the liquid lining. That covers the inside of the lung, the lung can't function. So fish have no way to replenish that liquid lining if they're out of the water and they die very quickly. As humans emerged from the sea, or as mammals emerged from the sea, they brought a little bit of the sea with them. What happened is the air sacs in the lung are lined with salt water. And, but you can't just put water on cells and hope it's going to stay there. You need some sort of detergent or surfactant that's going to let the water spread out. If I put water on this table, it would beat up and roll off. If I put the tiniest bit of dish soap on that drop of water, it would spread out and cover the whole table. So these type two cells in the lung, they make that surfactant, and they make even though they're only five percent of the cells in the lung. They're able to make enough surfactant to coat the whole lung, and that's how the air sacs of the lung stay open, and it's how air is able to transmit oxygen into the blood without damaging the cells of the lung at the same time. Okay, so let's go back to the medicine. We're talking about the RLF 100. What are the results so far? Well, first let's talk for a second about what the medicine does. Okay, and what the medicine sure. does. Is specifically binds to that type two cell in the lung. Doesn't bind anywhere else in the lung. It just targets that cell, and when it goes into that cell, it kills the coronavirus. It stops the virus's ability to divide and replicate. We're seeing we're seeing now the VTR. Yeah. This video, yeah. So I brought you a picture. So, so the coronavirus isn't too much trouble to people. It doesn't make you very sick until it gets down into the lung. And when it gets into the lung, it goes straight to that type two cell that's lining the lung, that's protecting the lining of the lung, and the spike of that virus binds to a specific receptor on that type two cell, and it enters the cell. It blocks the ability of the cell to make surfactant. It Increases the inflammation that's produced by the virus. The inflammation ultimately overwhelms the cell itself, and the surfactant layer of the lung is damaged. Of course, at that point, the virus lets loose and infects all the other cells. And VIP comes along; it binds to the same cell, and it blocks the virus's ability to replicate. It increases production of surfactant. It blocks those inflammatory cytokines. If you were to talk to a human drug developer and say, "Design me a molecule that does all these four things," the drug developer would say, "You're crazy. It can't be done." And yet, that's exactly what nature has invented over the course of 65 million years of evolution. Yeah, thank God we've got Mother Nature. So, what are the results so far? Well, so far, we've seen that. In an open-label study, because our phase three study is still ongoing, and we don't know the final results, but in an open-label study, we've seen 
a ninefold advantage in survival among patients who were too sick to get into our randomized phase three study, and a similar advantage in terms of recovery from respiratory failure, that is getting out of the ICU and going home to your family. And you mentioned that your FDA trial is still blinded, uh, so you don't know the results. Are there, but there are Houston results being seen anywhere else? So at this point, close to 150 people have been treated under expanded access in the United States, in Israel. Uh, we've even treated a few patients in Mexico. And on a regular basis, doctors are sending us x-rays, and I think I brought one of them for you, showing very dramatic recovery from uh, the signs of COVID-19. Here it is. You can see that uh, before the patient got the investigational drug, the lung was full of white stuff. And that white stuff is collapsed air sacs, collapsed alveoli. It's very characteristic of COVID-19. They call it ground glass appearance. And within 48 to 96 hours, that lung had improved very substantially and that patient went home. That's really interesting. It sounds like a human, natural uh, iron dome inside uh, your lung. Um, about well, but, but, but there's a reason for that, because the lung needs an ability to repair itself. Of course. So this peptide wasn't invented because of COVID-19. This peptide was invented so because animals wind up in forest fires, and they need some ability to repair the lung from smoke damage. Occasionally, animals inhale toxic things such as stomach acid, and the lung needs an ability to repair itself, this peptide is critical to natural repair of the lung. Interesting. Now, you played leadership roles in seven, right? Seven successful healthcare, IT, and biopharma startups with public exits. That's quite a record, I must say. Um, and, you know, we're living in these very different times of COVID-19. And I was wondering, what has changed in terms of the policy, the regulatory policy, and the process of, uh, you know, approving treatments? Well, at least in the United States, uh, the FDA has tried to really change its ways, change itself into a much more nimble organization. They established the Coronavirus Treatment Acceleration Program, and I haven't seen the FDA become easier on the rules, but I've, I've seen them become much quicker on the rules. So a meeting that used to take 90 days to get can now be had in nine days. They're still going to be tough on you, but they're going to do it a lot faster. And is there no danger in the fact that they're doing it faster and less tougher? Well, I didn't say they were doing it less tough. Okay. I said they were doing it faster. Uh, and, so uh, they could have done it faster before, or this is a conceptual change that will stay on after COVID, or they'll go back to their own pace? I'm getting emails from FDA scientists at 2 in the morning. I've never heard of a government scientist sending emails at 2 in the morning before. I think everybody's pretty focused on trying to not lose a second million people from this terrible disease. And what will stay with us post-COVID? Well, that's going to be an interesting question. Uh, I think uh, there will be far fewer in-person meetings at FDA. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, it used to be that you'd fly nine people to Beltsville, Maryland and put them in a Holiday Inn for a one-hour face-to-face meeting. And people are figuring out that there's an awful lot you can do remotely. Uh, I think data exchange will continue to be faster. Hopefully, people won't continue to be sending emails at 2 in the morning because <laughs> you can only sustain that for so just long. For so long, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, uh, just before we close, is there anything that you would like to uh, finish off with, leave us with uh, these remarks? Well, you tell me. We're, si we're sitting here in Israel, mm -hmm. and Israel's a country that's always followed the FDA. How do we get Israel to take the lead? How do we get Israel to start approving drugs here as a first place in the world to approve a drug instead of following the FDA. What is your thought on that? I think Israel needs an FDA. <laughs> an FDA, but yeah, that's, a, that's an idea, but that it wouldn't be the American FDA, it would be the Israeli FDA. That's right.
Well, there's the Chinese FDA. The Second FDA would be the Israeli FDA. That's right. Well, there's the Chinese FDA. There's the U.S. FDA. That's a challenge for all of us. Yeah, yes. That's, that, that, that's really a thought that we should take in consideration. Professor, Professor Javid, thank you so much for being with us and sharing with us your presentation and your information. And good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Javid. And now for a closing presentation, please welcome Dr. Luba Tao, 